Hi, I'm Bob Roswell, founder and a curator at the System Source Computer Museum. Today's gallery talk is about our slow, giant computer from 1963, the only remaining UNIVAC 490. I'm producing this video from home because we're under quarantine uh, due to COVID-19. Our UNIVAC 490 is the largest CPU we have in the collection. It's 12 feet, six inches wide, by six foot, six inches high, by three feet deep. And that's just the CPU. A uh, full setup looks something like this. The computer's in the background. We see a bunch of tape drives, a console operator. These pictures are all courtesy of the Hagley Library, which is up in Delaware, which has uh, the archives from the UNIVAC project. The, when the UNIVAC was delivered, um, hard drives had not been invented yet, but as soon as hard drives came out, one could add it to an existing UNIVAC um, installation. Just gotta love this picture of a hard drive from 1964. It's also the slowest single CPU that we have. Um, it's very difficult to benchmark computers across a 60 year period, but to a rough order of magnitude, the iPhone 4 on the left, I just used that because we, when we got the UNIVAC, the iPhone 4 was new, is about 110,000 times faster than the UNIVAC. And by one of those odd coincidences, the UNIVAC is so much larger, you could actually fit 110,000 iPhones inside the chassis of the UNIVAC. It's also the most expensive single CPU that we have. Um, we believe the original price was about $2 million in 1963, so that's about $16 million today. You may have noticed that many of the signs call this a real-time system. That's important. Um, most computers up until the 1970s were batch oriented. We went to a key punch, we punched in our program, we punched in our data, we walked over to an operator who submitted our card deck into a card reader. We waited, in my experience it was typically about a half an hour for the computer to run our job. Then we got green bar paper back, saw we made a mistake, repeated. A real-time computer, by contrast, could take data, uh, respond to your keystrokes, much like a modern computer does today, and it could take data from various instruments. That made the UNIVAC 490 the obvious choice for NASA in the um, Apollo and Gemini missions. So here's a picture of our 490 as it was set up initially at Goddard Space Flight Center in 1963. Over on the right-hand side, you will see a map of the world and strings um, that all lead to Goddard. Those strings are representing radio links. Those radio links are going to uh, uplinks that went to the Gemini and Apollo mission. So here's a picture of the one at the Goddard tracking station. It was a very narrow beam so that antenna had to track the spacecraft and telemetry went up and down to the spacecraft. As the spacecraft orbited the Earth, this antenna could no longer track it, so it went to another tracking station. There were 12 of these all the way around the world. And when there was no land, the tracking station would be on a Navy ship. Each tracking station also had a UNIVAC uh, 1218, also known as the UNIVAC CP855. Um, they pre-process the data, and we're lucky enough to have a 1218 in our collection. When the data was sent over a radio modem, it connected into the UNIVAC up in the top. You can see the connectors in the mirror at the top of the computer. And here's a close-up. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to find a stink bug, uh, reminding me of Grace Hopper's famous moth. Uh, here's an article explaining how it all worked from the UNIVAC newspaper. Uh, they're very proud of the fact that during the Gemini format uh, mission, it operated for 910 hours without a single failure. So it explains how the 1218s were strung around the bases and all the data was transmitted to Goddard and they were measuring in-flight telemetry, such as the <laughs> astronauts' pulse, their blood pressure, temperature, and other real-time data. 
Uh, another use for the UNIVAC was in um, a flight reservation system. So here's a picture of a travel agent using a UNIVAC terminal hooked to a 490. Um, got, um, Northwestern Airlines, um, Eastern Airlines, British Air all bought a 490. And for the first time, you could do online passenger reservations. At least a travel agent could. You have to imagine that before this, people would write your uh, reservation into a notebook for that flight. And of course, if you changed it, they had to get the white out. The Unifact 490 was also the very first computer that I ever saw with my own two eyes. Uh, here's a model of how it was set up at the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair. Um, visitors to the pavilion could look at the Unifact computer through a glass wall, and then we could walk up to a terminal and um, type in a topic. And within four seconds, the UNIFAC would spit out on a printout a 700-word essay from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, we do have a copy of a printout like this in the museum. Now let's switch gears and talk about the construction. Um, the UNIFAC has 16,500 transistors. That is a very simple processor. Modern CPUs typically have about 4 billion transistors on them. In this case, there are several transistors on each one of these circuit boards, along with some resistors, capacitors, diodes, etc. And each board has various colored test points. Um, it was difficult to make reliable systems in those days. The mean time between failure is quoted at 1,000 hours, and each one of these test points allowed us to put an oscilloscope in and monitor the performance of that section of the CPU. We're very fortunate to have a large book. Uh, this is about C-sized drawings, and each one of these is um, the electrical diagram of each one of those boards. Uh, I'm a beginning electrical engineer, but these circuits are simple enough that even I understand them. So each one of the boards has a number on it. That number corresponds to a drawing in the book. Of course, it takes about 1,500 of these boards to make up the CPU. From the front, it looks pretty neat. From the back, it's a wild, wild rat's nest. In fact, we have a museum. Fortune magazine article that shows the difficulties of the person wiring this up in 1962 before it was delivered. We also have uh, 90 kilobytes, uh, 90 kilowords, 90 kilobytes, 30 kilowords of core memory. Each one of these little magnetic donuts has three wires strung between it to make one bit. Um, so we have almost a million of these little donuts with three wires. They're put together in larger boards. Those boards are put together in stacks. Those stacks, we have a stack at the top of the door, the middle of the door down beneath this picture. And then there's three more sets of stacks on the reverse of the door. In this picture, we have a couple of gentlemen from where the Bowery Savings Bank in New York admiring their new Univac. Uh, that's all for today. When the COVID-19 virus is over, come visit us in Hunt Valley, Maryland.